Rangers extend their season-long losing streak to three games with a mind-numbing, mind-boggling, very dumb loss to the A's. And of course, the bullpen was the culprit. Talk about all that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now the Rangers lose four to three to the Oakland A's last night with their ace on the hill with their A bullpen in there and just could not get it done against the decidedly horribly constructed Oakland for now A's. This is an incredibly frustrating loss. Definitely the worst loss of the season so far. The most mind-numbing, mind-boggling, because, you know what, it was just one of those stupid games where the most random player in the world decides to go off, have the game of his life, and nobody else does quite enough to get over it. Shea Langoliers, player of the game. Three homer game, because, of course, why not? Why not the catcher who has been, you know, offensively challenged for his short major league career so far to go off and have the game of his life. But of course he's a hometown kid. He is a Keller high school graduate, a Baylor alum as well. And against the Texas Rangers, specifically a globe life field. <clears throat> Shay Langliers is just Babe Ruth. I guess a three homer day for him drove in all four of the A's runs in the four to three win and homered off three different pitchers. So three pitches was the difference in this game. Three, actually, I'll say two bad pitches because the last home run was just was just Shea Langoliers being on an absolute heater. First home run was a splitter from Nathan Iavalli that stayed in the zone, didn't drop all the way out of the zone. Shea Langoliers just got it and crushed it. Hat tip to him. That's 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 a pitcher not hitting a spot and a hitter with a lot of power. A lot of promise. Former first-round pick was the main return in the Sean Murphy trade, which is looking like absolute highway robbery by the Atlanta Braves. But he's a kid with some promise and and could end up being a a franchise-level catcher. Still very young. Still a long way to find out. Okay, one bad pitch from Evo. Still a pretty good night from him. Second pitch. Second homer. A hanging curveball up in the zone from David Robertson. The first run that David Robertson has allowed this year. Was the game tying Homer? Rangers had a 2 1 lead at that point. You think, okay, well, that's kind of stupid, but it's fine. Eventually, David Robertson was going to give up a run, he was going to have a zero ERA all year. That's that's not a, a reasonable thing to ask. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. Sugar hat. Ranger took the lead later on in that game, and you thought, okay, at literally the bottom of that inning. Okay, all right, 3 2 lead. It's, it's mostly fine. We'll see Kirby Yates in the eighth, and Yates was solid. And then see Jose Leclerc in the ninth inning. And uh, we'll see how that goes with the one-run lead. Thanks to an Evan Carter home run for that one-run lead. But anyway, you get to the ninth inning. And Pico does what Pico can do a lot of times. And he walked a guy. And it's not ideal. But it's still a one-run lead. Okay, well, tying runs on base. But it, it's the Oakland A's. They've been terrible all year. They were intentionally constructed to lose. And this is the worst lineup in baseball so far this year and it's it's honestly not particularly close maybe the marlins are close but but still this is not a great lineup and then up comes shea babe ruth langoliers Pico says okay well this guy's been hot as all heck so i'm, I'm gonna throw him a fastball first pitch up and out of the zone try and make him chase try and make him swing through it 94 point 95 point six miles an hour about three inches high out of the zone and <clears throat> what does shea langoliers do but tomahawk that thing for a game-winning home run and leave us all with our jaws on the floor saying, are you freaking kidding me, Oakland? The Oakland A's. 
now owners of a three-game winning streak because baseball is weird, and even the worst teams in the world go on winning streaks. Even the A's last year had a, what, seven, eight-game heater that they went on, and they still lost 106 or eight games, however many it was. It's a lot of games last year. And even they have some major league caliber players, like Shea Langeliers, who's apparently a god when he comes to Globe Life Field, because in 11 games at Globe Life Field in his career, he has six home runs. Six home runs? A 12-14 OPS in Globe Life Field in his home state. He also has three doubles, so nine extra base hits in 43 at-bats at Globe Life Field. Maybe the strategy now is just don't pitch to this guy in Globe Life Field when he is in front of his hometown friends and family, travel all the way from Keller to Arlington. Maybe just don't pitch this guy. He's got eight home runs in 92 games in Oakland Coliseum. Eight. And he's got six in 11 games at Globe Life Field. Maybe just stay away from this guy at Globe Life Field because that seems to be the MO. So three, two bad, one not perfect pitch from Jose Leclerc, and the Rangers end up losing this game because Shea Langlier has had the game of his life. Also, Mason Miller, as as the A's closer, once it was a one-run lead, I kind of knew this was over because Mason Miller is absolutely phenomenal out of the A's pen. He doesn't have the most command and control, but the dude can chuck absolute gas and uh, did so in the bottom of that ninth inning. So this Rangers bullpen, it's, it's not changing. There's not going to be... Now, there's not going to be a trade in April. I just had about half a dozen people in my mentions last night saying, oh, the Rangers need to trade for a closer. No, stop it. Stop it. It's April 10th. We are 11 games into the season. Also, do you remember when the Rangers traded for a closer? An elite back-end reliever, literally that last year? How reliable and safe you felt with Raul Chapman on the hill? Oh, and what was the return? Oh, I don't know, a guy that's maybe going to win a Cy Young in his career, who's already phenomenal and was phenomenal at the time, and the Rangers knew that, and they knew the the chance. That, that was the Rangers trading for him a month early, right? trading for Chapman a month early from the deadline. This is, we're, what, three and a half months away from the deadline? And we are 11 games into the season. Pico has bro- blown two games. We are going to calm down. We're going to take a deep breath and remember that there are 162 of these stinking baseball games until we get to the playoffs, until we get to the postseason. So let's all just take a deep breath and remember that even the good bullpens, even the most elite ones, remember remember the Astros? Did you want the Rangers to go spend $90 million on a closer in Josh Hader? Guy who has a six ERA right now and two blown saves, two losses. Actually, I think it's more than two blown saves. It's just two losses that he's charged with. Oh, that guy's got a six ERA in six games so far. Oh, maybe he wanted the guy who was the closer last year for for the Astros and their amazing bullpen. He's got an ERA of 11 and a half right now. That's Ryan Presley in six games. Or maybe you want Brian Abreu, who's got a 579 ERA in five games. These bullpens, even the good ones, are finicky, tricky, unreliable, unpredictable. Even the best guys. But some of you want to trade for a closer in April. Just calm. Calm. Zen. Bruce Bochy's not changing his closer right now. If Jose Leclerc ends up blowing more games and in more maddening fashion, Jose Leclerc's not going to be the closer all year. It's not set in stone. But panicking after 11 games, it's it's not Bruce Bochy's M.O. He is the Zen Meister. The Zen Master. The vibes king. Remember the ups and downs of last year and how many incredibly high highs and low lows this team went through last year? Mainly just in the month of August and also all throughout the entire season and definitely throughout the postseason. This is a game that is unpredictable. And Bruce Bochy is not going to hit the panic button ever in his life. Especially 11 games into the season where... By the way, the Rangers still have a winning record. They're still second in the division. And oh, by the way, I listed off the amount of ins- the insane amount of injuries that the Rangers have uh, um, on their injured list right now. You know, 14 All Star appearances combined, five Cy Youngs, a Silver Slugger, a Gold Glover, and you know, several good bullpen options. It's April 
10th. That loss absolutely stunk. Stunk to high heavens and really stinks because the Rangers are trying to avoid having an actual losing streak two games in a row. I don't consider a streak. Three losses in a row. That's not great, especially when you have Nate Eovaldi on the hill. And by the way, we're going to talk about how much he's been dealing so far this season. Right after this, we from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. So don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, take your pick of more or less, then add them to your prize picks entry today. Prize picks is the best way to get in on the action on sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Testing your skills this baseball season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you've got the skills, you can turn $10 into $100 with just a few taps. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Now, despite the loss, there were some positive notes from the Rangers in this Tuesday night game against the A's. The main of which is that their ace... Ace for now. Ace until Jacob deGrom comes back. Nate Eovaldi once again stepped up in an effort to end a losing streak. Five and two-thirds innings, just three hits, one run off of that solo shot, a couple of walks, and eight strikeouts against this Oakland A's team and looked just phenomenal yet again for the Rangers. I mean, the guy has stepped up time and time again for this Rangers team over the last year and a month or so, basically since he signed with the Rangers. And he was just dealing in this one. 21 swings and misses for him. 16 called strikes. 37 called strikes plus whiffs. That is nearly you know, 40% of his pitches that were either called strikes or strike swinging because this Oakland team really likes to chase. And Nathan Eovaldi was happy to oblige them in getting those swings and misses. Got seven of those whiffs off the fastball, the most he's had this season, I'm pretty darn sure. Eight whiffs off the splitter, six whiffs off the curveball. So all three of his main three pitches were working. Did use more four seamers in this game than he did last game, or at least more than he used the splitter, which was really, really working against the Rays. 28 splitters, 24 curveballs, pretty pretty equal distribution from those. Also used the cutter pretty effectively a couple of times, used the slider. Uh, overall, a pretty darn good game for Nate the Great Eovaldi, which the Rangers desperately needed because they are in the middle of this prolonged stretch where they're hoping to get some reinforcements back, but Michael Lorenzen's rehab start with AAA Round Rock was rained out last night, so he will pitch today at 4.30, and then the Rangers will see when they can get him back in this rotation that ran out. is just really inconvenient for the Rangers, who were hoping to have him back uh, another day earlier, but that is not going to happen because Mother Nature, and uh, it's really nice to have a roof on your baseball stadium. Just a really, really nice thing when the rains come and you don't have to sit there in a four-hour rain delay or worry about that at all because you have a roof on your stadium. Even if it looks ugly sometimes, still very, very valuable thing to have, especially when it's 109 degrees in August at first pitch. But Nate the Great Eovaldi has been fantastic this season. So far, his off-speed run value, which is the run value of his splitter, is in the 100th percentile of baseball. 100th. Number one, he has the best off-speed pitch in all of baseball so far this season. That's how freaking good the splitter has been. Now, I think those numbers were juiced a little bit with that, that game against the Rays, but it's been effective for him. He's used it a lot, and he's used it very, very effectively. His fastball run value is in the top 12% of baseball. Overall, just pitching run value, 99th percentile. That's the overall value of his pitching is in the top 1% of pitchers in all of baseball. Yeah, that's right. Nate freaking Eovaldi. He's not walking guys as much as he did last year. He's not allowing as many home runs as last year. He's striking guys out at a better rate. Still not insane or elite, but still pretty darn good. And more than that, good enough. 
averaging over six innings per start. Again, the Rangers need this guy very, very badly to be the best version of him spell himself. A 1.45 ERA to this point in the season. Expected ERA is a little bit higher than that at 281, but still solid, serviceable, getting you deep into games. Would have liked to see him be able to get that final out, um, but still pitch count rose up just a little bit on him. But five and two-thirds innings of one run ball with eight strikeouts and 21 whiffs is a fantastic day for Nate Eovaldi, as well as, well, at least one member of this Rangers pen was having a nice day. Kirby freaking Yates. One perfect inning, still has not allowed a run this season. And if the Rangers are going to make a change in their closers role, I think that Yates might be the guy at this point. Maybe it'll be Robertson. Maybe it'll be Yates. Maybe it'll be Spores when he comes back, because that injury is looking a little more dicey just for the the sake of this pen. It seems like it's just going to be the 15 days for Josh Spores on the IL with that shoulder issue. But again, the Rangers could use every high leverage arm they can get during this stretch. I think we'll see somebody cycle out of this bullpen at some point later on. Maybe it'll be this series in Houston, depending on who gets used and how much in these over these next two games. But 17 games in 17 days is a lot of games, especially early on in the season. The Rangers are going to need to use a decent chunk of their pen. Hopefully, Cody Bradford can come in and, and the Rangers can just, you know, beat the snot out of this A's pitching staff for the final two games of the season because three runs against this A's staff, especially when Alex Wood was really on the ropes in this one. It's just, it's not quite enough. And after the final eight innings of Monday night's game where the Rangers just could not get any offense going, against not even the best relievers in Houston's pen. And on Sunday, when they were just flummoxed and nearly blanked by Ronel Blanco, it's just three games in a row of the offense not quite doing exactly what it needs to is is just incredibly frustrating. But again, having a guy like Yates and Robertson, I know Robertson did blow a save, is charged with a blown save, even though it wasn't an actual save opportunity or whatever the the actual roles with that are. It's the first time he's allowed to run all season. You give him a pass. And he's been in the big league since 2008. Um, yeah, happy birthday, David Robertson. Here's your first home run that, and the first run you've allowed this season. 39 years old. Again, 2008 Yankees is where he came up and where he learned that cutter from Mariano Rivera, who would still be in the league for another, what, first five years of his career? This guy's been around a while and he's he's been Pretty darn reliable out there in the back end of a bunch of different bullpens. As has Yates, for the most part. He really does look healthy. All that talk about how last year he wasn't quite sure if he was, you know, he still had it. If he was still able to get guys out at an elite rate. Well, he he showed that last year. Showed the strikeouts were there. And the walks have not been there as much this year as they were last year. Which usually is the case from a guy coming back from, from elbow surgery is that you know, the first year, the command is, is not quite fully back. It's really the second year after you come back from the surgery that everything starts to look more like it did before you went under the knife. And so far, that's been the case for Kirby Yates, who has not allowed a single run still yet this season. And he's 37 years old, 37 years old still kicking four innings, four strikeouts. His zero ERA is exactly what you want to see from this guy and uh, just, where did we go? Where's the number of walks? Zero. Zero. Zero walks from a reliever. That's nice to see. You you don't always see it. Stares angrily at Jose Leclerc. But still, it's early on this season. This bullpen has the options, which is why the Rangers, I don't think, will be trading for a reliever in the month of June this year. They might trade for one when it comes time for July and the deadline. Or they might just bring one of their young guys up that I'm surprised haven't been called up yet, whether it's Mark Church, whether it's Antoine Kelly, whether it's Emiliano Toyoto moved to the pen and fast track to the big leagues because he's also got some pretty nasty stuff. The Rangers have some options, which is not something they had last year, and why even when they have these struggles with the bullpen early, which again, every team does. Having those options is why Bruce Bochy is not yet going to hit the panic button on Pico. And even though this offense hasn't looked great over these last three games, I'm starting to get a little more concerned about a couple of different hitters who might just be pressing. I'm going to talk about that right after this word from our sponsors. 
This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always get exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your right every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Now, the Rangers' offense is still the strength of this team, and it's... It feels a little nitpicky to <clears throat> to nitpick this offense that's scoring five and a half runs per game that you look at the everyday starting lineup and there are five different hitters with an OPS plus north of 130. So more than half of this everyday lineup that is at least 30% better than the league average hitter through 11 games this season. But I'm going to nitpick it anyway because that's what I do. And after a loss like that, it's just really frustrating to watch. But for the most part, this Rangers offense is continuing to have good at-bats, is continuing to put pressure on teams and continuing to score runs at an elite rate. They still are doing that. But some of the things that I've seen from from certain hitters, and mainly the two main culprits I'm talking about are, are Jonah Heim and, of course, Wyatt Langford, who is starting to have some at-bats that are making me a little worried. Now, Jonah Heim did have his first home run of the season, an absolutely glorious moonshot. He did while right-handed. It was the first Rangers homer off of a lefty, which kind of makes you scratch your head and go, huh, interesting, interesting. The Rangers have not hit their home runs off of lefties that much this year when you have so many good power-hitting righty bats in Adoles Garcia, in Wyatt Langford, in Marcus Simeon, in Zeke Duran, and uh, yeah, they had Josh Young for about six games which was very very fun but anyway you look at this offense and it's mainly see mainly white langford's last at bat that made me scratching my head a little bit just it looks like he's starting to expand the zone a little bit more than he has done before trying to be a little bit too aggressive he still doesn't have his first home run and only has a couple of extra base hits which he got in the first series of the season and hasn't had one since but he's still walking at a pretty decent rate still not expanding the zone um still not swinging missing his his whiff rate is in the top 15 percent of baseball and he's still very very fast and legged out an infield hit yet again and also worked a walk in this one but it's starting to seem like he is pressing just a little bit 11 games into his big league career he has not had a day off yet and so far he's been getting a less than generous zone called on him he has been a little less aggressive than I thought he would be at the plate in terms of just mashing these these cookie pitches that he probably should have at least one homer at this point in the season. But he's still a good hitter. He's still going to figure it out. He adjusts very quickly. So I don't anticipate this slump is going to last much longer. But with, with Heim, Heim is usually, if this lineup's fully healthy, probably the number eight hitter in this lineup. Maybe number nine hitter. But despite having that home run, a first pitch fastball that he just jumped on and absolutely roped out in there to left field for his first dinger of the year, first time time bomb of the year, it feels like a lot of his at bats have been over a little bit before they've started. It feels the same way about Adolis Garcia, who has an OPS north of 800, has four home runs on the season. But there's one at bat in particular with Adolis Garcia that really changed the course of this game. It was bases loaded, no outs, and the Rangers have been the recipients of a very bad strike zone the last three days, which has been really frustrating to watch. Um, but one bad pitch, down 0-1 the count, a, a ball that was both down and in to Adolis Garcia, the first pitch of a bases loaded, no outs jam that the Rangers could have just blown this thing wide open and probably should have, and it gets called strike one. You're down 0-1. Adoles Garcia does not like the pitch, very frustrated, but takes his time out and says, okay, I'm going to, you know, gather myself and uh, we'll, we'll recoup. We're, we're down 0-1. It's not the end of the at-bat. But then comes pitch number two, and it's a slider down and in and pretty far in. He swings at it and fouls it off, doesn't swing and miss, but now he's down 0-2 in the count, and he 
battles for a couple more pitches, but ends up grounding out, hits the ball hard, 100 miles an hour, right to the pitcher, a 1-2-3 double play, scores zero runs. The Rangers also have a strikeout from Jonah Heim immediately after that, who is hitting fifth in this lineup because of the multitude of injuries at this point. And the Rangers waste their biggest chance of the game, get zero, zero out of a bases loaded, no outs situation with your number four, five, and six hitters that were due up. You didn't even get to the six hitter. You didn't even get to Zeke Duran at that point, who had some pretty good at-bats in this one, including an 11-pitch walk, a couple walks for Zeke Duran, who, despite not having some great numbers so far, his walk rate being 16.7%, that is an elite walk rate. And that was the one thing that I really wanted Zeke Duran to do this year, was learn to walk a, a, before you can crawl. Well, I guess learn to walk before you can drive in runs is is more the metaphor here but Zeke Duran working those walks being more patient not chasing as much he's still chasing he's still I, I don't know how he has a 41.3 percent chase rate and a 16.7 percent walk rate that doesn't really particularly make sense to me but then again Zeke Duran is a guy who defies expectations but Jonaheim having these these at bats that are a lot of quick ground outs not a whole lot of hard contact you know it's Barrel rate, his hard hit percentage, both those in the bottom quarter of the league. His chase rate in the bottom 10% of the league, that's worrisome. And his walk rate of 0%, that's concerning. That's concerning for a guy who, you know, his offense at times, especially early on in the season the last couple of years, has been just red hot. He has been incredibly hot from day one. But the Rangers slow played him this spring training. They built him back up. They are trying to get him off his feet more often, using Andrew Kisner more often than they used Mitch Garver and eventually Austin Hedges as the backups last year, just because he had the longest season of his life, suffered that wrist injury in, in the back half of the year, and even in the playoffs, wasn't really quite the full offensive version of himself. And so the Rangers are hoping to get a better second half from Jonah Heim, but they've gotten such incredible first halves the last couple of years that... uh the Rangers could really use that right now with Josh Young and Nathaniel Lowe on the IL and Corey Seager getting more scheduled days off early on this year than he did last year because the Rangers are trying to keep him healthy for the long run. And he wasn't a hundred percent when it came to opening day. I mean, he just had that surgery right before spring training started and played in what two, three spring training games before the season started and is still not up to a hundred percent. And also, you might want to give Corey Seager some more days off just in general to keep him healthy throughout the year so he's not missing 40 games again this year, unlike last year. But once you start losing those bats, once you lose a Josh Young and you also lose a Nathaniel Lowe, and um, but that's really all they're losing so far. And you might lose Corey Seager for points of the season. And, oh, you lost to Justin Foscue as well. Another call-up that just immediately gone. And you start to get deeper on into this bench and deeper onto this farm system because I can't believe I've gone this far without saying congratulations, Davis Wenzel, who is a big leaguer now, his first big league start coming in Arlington. A overall solid game for him. Uh, didn't strike out in his first big league game, so uh, that's a win. Played pretty solid defense at third base, and um, we'll see if he can get his first big league hit while he is up, while Justin Foskey is on the IL, and while Josh Young continues to be on the IL. But there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on Jonah Heim to have better at-bats, and we're also not seeing great at-bats from Adolis Garcia so far this year. I know he's got an OPS over 800, he's got four home runs, but the walk rate is very concerning. Two walks in 49 plate appearances is, is not what we saw from El Bombi last year. It's, it's not the El Bombi that hit 40 home runs. He might still hit 40 home runs this year, but he's not going to have an OPS north of 800 for much longer if he's striking out 15 times to two walks. That's, that's not it. He is getting behind these counts, and he is giving away at bats. It's down 0-2 before you can even blink, and he's having a tough time battling back from it. He was hitting the high fastball for home runs. That was a great sign of him not chasing and being able to hit the pitch that was giving him the most fits last year and, and really throughout his career. But he's ch back to chasing at a alarming rate, striking out at a worrisome rate, and not mixing in those walks to keep pitchers honest. It's just a few little things. It's 
11 games in the season, and we'll see if this ends up continuing to be a trend. I don't anticipate it will be. Uh, I don't anticipate that this team is going to you know, keep having so few home runs. This is a power-hitting team. The Rangers only have two hitters who have got multiple home runs. One of them is Josh Young, who played four games this season, and the other is Adoles Garcia. Everybody else has one or zero, and I think that trend is going to hopefully be next by the end of this A series. I'm hoping that this game two, the Rangers can come out, be pissed, and just start clobbering on the A's lineup and then go to Houston, a park where they have hit pretty well and have a five-game active winning streak and continue to mash for some of those extra base hits, but not get out of their approach, not get out of what has made them so successful at scoring runs because the Rangers' offense is good because they take what is given to them. If the pitchers want to walk them 10 times in a game, they will take 10 walks. If the pitchers are giving them pitches that you can do nothing but hit singles and and foul off, then the Rangers will hit a dozen singles and still score eight runs. If the Rangers are given pitches where they can mash them for home runs, they will hit them for home runs. But they do not usually get out of their very, very good approach. Seeing them get out of it a little bit early on is a little worrying. But again, I'm really nitpicking an offense that is in the elite range of five and a half runs per game it's still early there are still things to be ironed out but a frustrating loss like this spiraling into hopefully what has already been a three-game losing streak hopefully it doesn't turn into a four-game losing streak the rangers cannot afford to lose an early season series to the a's but even if they do they are still the reigning world series champs that's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.